Right, so we're looking at this first question here. To find the term algorithm, what we're talking about is, is a sequence of instructions, mark one, second mark, to achieve a goal or task. So I'll be writing that up. Let's have a look at the second question then. Uh, the following are computer science terms, abstraction, data type, decomposition, efficiency, and input. Quickly going over it right now. Please, please get that note, Darren. Abstraction, abstraction is when you remove unnecessary detail to let you focus on what's important. Data type, remember what some of the data types were? Anybody remember? No. Integer, which is a number. whole number, brilliant. Uh, string, which is a word. word and text, brilliant. Character, Single letter, perfectly done. Could be a number as well, but on its own, yeah. Uh, floating point. Number, but with decimal places. Last one, begins with B. Boolean, true or false. Decomposition. Decomposition is when we do what? Break it down. It's perfect. When we have a bigger idea and to solve it, instead of solve it in one go, we break it into smaller pieces which if they're still complicated, we break down again until each piece is simple to solve. Efficiency, so we looked at linear search and binary search. Both those algorithms, do they achieve the same goal? Yeah. 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 But what was different, if you remember, was about efficiency. When the number of items increased, which one became more efficient? Binary search became more efficient, while linear search stayed Inefficient. Remember which was the more efficient sort out of bubble sort and merge sort? Merge. merge sort. As the size becomes bigger, it becomes more. So that's what efficiency. Efficiency is that you could write the same, you can write to achieve the same goal, you can write it differently, but there will actually be different efficiencies. And finally, input. I don't think that's really a computational term. What is input? Data being entered into the system. Right, so let's have a read. Uh, we've got to link it now. What's that? So on here, we've got, whoops, breaking a problem down into a number of sub-problems. Breaking an idea into a number of sub-problems. What do we think that's going to be? Decomposition. Decomposition. Of course it is. Awesome. So that would be C for that. The process of removing unnecessary detail from a problem. Abstraction. Abstraction. Absolutely. So what you don't want to do is make your problem more complicated than it needs to be. So you remove unnecessary detail to let you focus on the important information abstraction. And then finally, defines the range of values a variable may take. So what could restrict the type of values a variable could take? What do you reckon? Data type. Because if it's a string, if it's a, sorry, if it's an integer, could you be storing letters in there? No, absolutely. And you couldn't be storing floating point numbers, right? Uh, so that would be data type for that last one there, C-A-B. So originally, we had a little, sorry, last week in fact, is our first lesson back in that double. Do you remember we looked over linear search and binary search and the two sorting algorithms? I know it was kind of a whistle-stop tour, but do you remember I was writing up what were the crucial things we have to remember? So sometimes it's describe how it works, sometimes it's demonstrate how it works. This is describe. So it's three marks, guess what you need to do? Yeah, what are the three steps in the algorithm that you need? And I'll give you a moment to think about what those three steps might be. So, if we remember a linear search, we could have some items like, uh, I don't know, uh, these are just some random items we'll put in here. We've got like 9, 15, 14, 3, and 10. And let's say we're searching for the item uh, 14. Let's think about how that's going to work. In a linear search, you go to the first item in the list, point 0.1 and you compare that to your search term. Are they the same? Uh, no. So first, it first thing, start at the first item. Second thing is compare it to your search term. If they're not the same, you should then move on to the next item. And then you'd say, no. they're not the same. So you move on. Yes. And what we've done now, we have Compared. found the item. We found it, located so it. How do you explain it in work? Then? I'm with you. One sec. The first point we want to include was what, Lennon? Start 
at the beginning of the list. Once you start with that first item in the list, what's the second thing that you're going to need to do? Compare. Right, absolutely. So compare your search term to the item to see if it matches. Compare the item to the search term. In my case, in my example, remember that was 14. Uh, and then we could say, if match, if matched, what, what's the case? If they've matched, what's happened? You found it. If not, we should repeat. Well, go, yeah, exactly. Go to the next item and repeat. Go to next item. And then the third point, what was the third point? Until, so, and, you, so, and then you should say repeat until what's the two things that could happen? Either A, it ends. repeat, yeah, well, well, it could either find it, or the array ends. Yeah, and repeat until found, or if we get to the end, and if we get to the end, it meant, what did it mean again? Alpha, you were saying, if we get to the end and we haven't found it, it means? It's not there. It's not there. In this question here, we're now looking at binary search, and you can see it's taken the other tack this time. How does it work this tack differently this time? Well, it's asking you to actually demonstrate it. So let's look at this problem. State the comparisons, so which of these items will be compared that you would make if using a binary search algorithm. So you have to remember how it's executed and then say which ones are going to happen. Use to search for the value 30. So 30 is the term we're looking for in the following array. Array indices have been included above the array. So position 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. All right. Binary search. What is the first thing that you're going to do in a binary search? Remember? Sorry. Anybody remember? Start, start it down. Linear search start at the beginning. Binary search, Alfie? Composition. Like you've got to break it down. It's about breaking it in half, absolutely. And you find the... Middle. The middle. No. So... No, that's right. Find the middle, and then you either, do you remember, you either be higher or lower, you're going to discard either the left or the right. So, find middle. What would the middle item be? Boom. Now that I'm searching for 30, what am I going to do? Because it's 30, is it's 21 going to be higher or lower than 30, Lewis? Lower. 21 is lower than 30. Being as that 21 is lower than 30, what are we going to do? Get rid of them. Yeah. Because 21, uh, because 21 is, sorry, because 30 is higher than 21, it must be on this side, right? It must be on the right side. So what you do is you would exclude all of those items on the left. So find middle item, and then I'm saying, what am I saying? I'm saying discard left. Right, what do I need to do in this new list? So this is the new list we've got here. What am I going to do? So the middle item is going to be 31, isn't it? Find middle of new list. Hello, I know. 31. What's the comparison you're going to make with 31, guys? What's the comparison you're making with 31? What are you searching for again? 30. So we're going to compare what? What are we going to say? Is 30 lower than 31? Is 30 lower than 31? Therefore, it can't be these two. So then we discard this time to the which way? Which, right. Perfect. And so you discard these items here, that one and that one, leaving you with... Whoops, not in blue, in blue. So uh, it's going to be 27, so that's the one. And it's going to be neither higher nor lower. And then finally you'd say, well, 30 you could say is higher. In fact, yeah. And then what's left? Nothing. Nothing. <clears throat> Item not in list. Yeah, that's what your last thing would say. Item not present. Now, in all honesty, do you think you could get all three marks for saying 21, 31, 27? Yeah. Yeah, you would. 
Why have I written this out? To help you, yeah? And I suppose potentially, if you miscalculated it, somebody might give you a pity mark and say, well, they know it's the middle item, they've just picked the wrong one. Possible. I suppose maybe I would, actually. It's me, to be fair, so I probably would give you that, wouldn't I? Well, I'm pretty... Yeah? Uh... yeah. <laughs> to be clear, if you, don't, if you get the completely wrong thing, you write anything down. I'm not... I'm not... Uh, so you can just erase it with, with a special pen of yours and then just... Just look at the answer hey. and it will suddenly Clarice, just so that we don't have any misunderstandings, and I'm sure you, integrity really matters to me, trying to do the right thing, which is why I'm so soft to do things like wear my mask next to you guys. I'm only taking it for now for recording. Yeah. Last question, really critical to binary. For a binary search algorithm to work correctly on an array of integers, what property must be true about the array? Single thing, well, what is it? What does a binary search have to have? It has to be ordered. Must be ordered, thank you. Yeah, must be ordered. Must be in order. If it's not in order, in either ascending or descender, guess what? Won't work. Won't work. And therefore, you'd have to use uh, 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 linear. linear search. Okay? <laughs> or alternatively, and we'll look at that now, you sort it and then use binary search. So, Remember, there's two sorts, merge sort and bubble sort, which we've looked at. Let's remember that you could either be asked to describe it or demonstrate it. In this case, we've been asked to demonstrate it. The first half of the algorithm has been done for us. It has already been split into n number of sublists, i.e., you know, there was an original list, and then it's been split into these. And it's very kind to you. They're showing you what the order would be to put it back together again. So this one, seven and three, where do you think they're going to go? Seven. They're going to go here. Yeah. And exactly what's going to happen, so these two will come down into these boxes. And what would happen is you'd compare these two items. It doesn't say whether to put it into ascending or descending order, so let's assume it's ascending. So we put those in descending order, so it would be three and seven. What about the next box? What are we going to put down there? One and four. One and four. What about the next box? Two and eight, they're already in ascending order. What about the last box? Five and six. And now here, it's going to be those two going down there and these two going down there. The arrows are not necessary. I'm only putting them there to help you remember how it works. And so imagine there's an arrow here and an arrow here, a pointer here, a pointer here. Which one's lower? One. One. One goes in. And then like the arrow moves up. Which one's lower? Three or four? Three. 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 And then... Four, and then seven. This is exactly it. Here we go. 2856. What are we going to end up writing down for this one? 2568. Two, five, six, How many marks is this? That's three marks for that. That's some of the easiest three marks in the entire universe, isn't it? Okay. This is why I wanted to make the time to do the search and sorts with you, right? Probably shouldn't have recorded that. Anyway, state one advantage of the merge sort compared to the... Uh, sorting algorithm you figure sort two. So, so, so it's first is bubble. Different. No, but that's the answer. The other one, so what's one advantage of merge sort versus... It's, much, it's faster. Yeah, it's more efficient, but particularly when... When there's more than Yeah. In particular... Oh, no. I've run out of space. <laughs> there you go, good. In, it's more efficient, in particular, when what? When there is a large, when there are a lot, when there's, oh no, there's, when there are large, oh, yeah, because they've started with an array, so it makes sense to continue it. Oh, question like this, if you saw what they're asking you to do as well. They're asking you to pick from either merge sort or bubble sort, and then you'd have to like circle the one you want to do. I'm going to demonstrate both. So I'm going to quickly do merge over here. So we've got, what, you've got eight, four, one, five. Uh, you'd want to show, oh no, that is awful how I've done that. There you go. And then you'd want to show it that you'd, how you'd split it up, and then finally split it into Guys, which one do you reckon it looks like I'm demonstrating? Merge. Guys? Shh. Is this merge bubble sort? 
this is merge sort I'm demonstrating. So the first thing I want to do is you split it up. Should we write this down? I, I would. Yeah. I'm going to narrate it as I'm doing it, just so that you have an opportunity to see it in action. So the first thing that happens is you split it in half. It's always split in half. 8-4 goes on one side, 1-5 goes on the other side, and then finally into n number of sublists, i.e. four sublists because you've got four items, and you write it down. Yeah? So that's the demerge bit. And in the last one, this is a bit you got up to, and what was the next bit you needed to do? Now you need to merge it. So these will come together again. Remember, it's like the mirror image. So this is the pattern that's gonna happen for the merging it back together again. I find it helpful sometimes to put the pattern out and then you can populate it. Eight and four are gonna go in here. It's assuming it's going in ascending order because it doesn't specify, you can make the assumption. Generally, I've not seen to try and catch you out at GCSE. At A level it happens, where they sort of put in descending as the last word and nobody reads it. So eight and four, and one, four and eight on the outside, we'll flip it over. The other side it is in ascending order is one and five. And then finally, we're going to merge these together in ascending order. So it'll be one, four, five, and then eight. So that's merge. Now, what we hadn't done before, and it's worth my opportunity to demonstrate it, is bubble sort. Well, maybe I should make it clear. There you go. And then here, bubble. So what we do is we'll write out our list. Eight, four, one, and five. I might have made that too large. Remember what happens. You don't have to do what I'm going to do now, which is draw a bubble around the two items. I do it to try and link the idea of the swap with the name of bubble. That's why I do it. So what's the first step? What's, going to, what's the first thing that's going to happen in a bubble sort? What's the first two items? Of, so we're going to compare eight and four, and what are you going to say about them? Are they in the right order? Are they in ascending order? Eight and four. Uh, no. no. So what should we do? Put them in order. We should swap them. Oh, no. So now it's four, eight, one, five. Where's the bubble move up to next? Eight and one. Beautiful. Are they uh, in ascending order? No. So what should we do? Swap. Swap. Do the same for eight and five. Do we swap them? Yeah. So then we've got four, one, five, eight. Something significant has, ha significant has happened. Do you know what it is? First pass. So what's happened with that first pass is we've established that eight is in the right position. And second. Uh, well, but we don't, it, it's, it is the case, but we don't know that yet. You have to actually go through the stages. So what's the first thing? So now we reset. That's what I say pass. Jesus, one second. Okay, I mean, there's a limit. My apologies. First pass. So where's the two things you're going to compare now that you've reset? Yeah, four and one is going to get compared. What do we do? Swap them. So then it's one, four, five, and eight. And then it would be, well, then it would be four and five would get compared in the right way. And actually, that's the second pass. And technically, the third pass and the fourth pass are not necessary because we can see that you can go all the way across here without any swaps. So that's it. Technically, for these questions, what they want you to do is they say, show the steps, is show where you've had to make swaps. I find drawing the bubbles here helps consolidate the idea or synthesize the idea of the word bubble and the process that happens. In terms of efficiency, merge is better. Merge is one drawback, though, in comparison. Do you remember what it was? Merge sort requires additional space, while bubble sort can be done in the original array. Okay. Uh, merge sort is more efficient with larger number of items, but in terms of demonstrating it, I would say, most of the time, this is the first time you've ever had a choice here, so I don't know if you're going to get one. I pick the one that you are feel confident about. You know, and it's probably down to the individual. Okay, people, state what is meant by the term pixel. What was the definition for pixel? Remember? We talked about it yesterday. Yep, go on. A single dot of color, right? Do you remember I said that you can say it is short for picture element? Uh, you know what I'll say? Since I'm marking it now, I'll give you a mark for that. So either picture element, because that's what pixel is short for, that's what the abbreviation is, or single dot of color. I've always hated that definition, so... <laughs>
but either way, I'll give it, yeah? So state the maximum number of different colors that can be used if a bitmap image has a color depth of six bits. So reading the question, I think you just got it. But the question was, if you have a color depth of six bits, how many colors can you make? Quick recap, one bit, two bit, three bit, four bit, five bit, six bit. Just a recap, you're right, you are right, so I just wanna go through it. If you've got those number of bits, of bits, how many colors can you make? If you have one bit, how many colors can you make? Because you're gonna either zero or one, so it'd be two colors. If it's two bits, you have four. Three bits, you have eight. Four bits, you have 16 colors. Five bits, you have 32. And six bits, you have 64 colors. In this case, it's, it's the way where it's asking you the bits, and you would say that the answer is, what was the answer again? 64. Colors, beautiful. And then over here, this is the kind of classic question you get, which is to calculate the file size. If you remember, file size with the image is pixels, or number of pixels times by bits, or color depth, sorry. So what is the minimum file size for 800 by 1000 pixels that uses 20 different colors? You give your answer in kilobytes. So I've got people to do the question. And Louis, thank you for volunteering. How would I answer this question? Um, well, you'd want to find the resolution first, which is 800 times 1,000. So in fact, do you know what I'll do? I'll write the formula down for, for future reference. As you were saying, the first thing is the resolution. So how do we establish what that is? Um, you take the pixel resolution times it. Okay, so the dimensions of the image, we multiply them together. So 800 times uh, 100, oh, sorry, 800 times 1,000. So uh, 800,000. 800, and then times that by... Uh, well, it, there isn't a thing with 20 <coughs> different colours, so you'd have to round up to the next one. Thank you. That's where people might spot it. Because remember, if you had 4-bit colour depth, you would have how many? Um, how many? 16. 16. We just established it. So to have at least 32 color, to have at least 20 colours, we'll have to go to 5-bit colour depth. Yes, to look at this one here, because we're looking for uh, 20 different colours, 4-bit color depth will give us 16 colors. So we have to use 5-bit, and maybe we're not using 12 of them, but it will be enough. So times by what? Uh, thank you, carry on. Times by what? Five. Perfect. So that's going to give us the answer of, what's the answer? Carry on. 4 million. Is 4 million the answer that we should provide? No. So that's 4 million what? Uh. Bits. It's four million bits. And what did it want? Ah, now how, now how do we turn it into bytes if that's the first thing we want to do? Divided by eight. So that's going to give us four million divided by eight. It's going to give us 500,000. And at this point, we've got 500,000 what? Bytes. B Y T E S, and then finally we need to put it into kilobytes. So in kilobytes, it would be five hundred K B. And so I put down the here at the bottom as well. So with sound representation, we've got to bear in mind that we've got two uh, factors that we care about: sample rate how often we test the wave, measured in hertz. 10 hertz means that we'd sample it 10 times a second. And sample resolution is how accurately, or how many bits we use to measure the amplitude of the wave. Of the wave. In this case, our scenario is, a sound engineer is recording a singer. Oh, using what kind of device are you gonna be using? Microphone. Microphone, we're recording it. Turning it from what into what? Beginning with A. Beautiful, Alfie, from analog waves into digital. Digital, in this case, being ones and zeros. Describe why the sound must be converted to a digital format before it can be stored on a computer system. So what are we going to be talking about? Did we finish answering this question? No. We said sound is analog, which are waves. What's the problem with that recording to a computer? Bingo. So to store it on a computer, we need to turn it into digital ones and zeros. Um, you remember we did, like, we talked about DAX. I think I was talking about them in my last lesson. Was I talking about DAX with you guys? I can't remember now. Maybe not. Maybe a long, long time ago. Digital audio. That's, yeah, digital 
Uh, digital analog conversion, actually, is what it is, because it's trying to turn it back from the ones and zeros back out. I remember a long time ago, I confessed to being a complete snob, pretending I could hear the difference and spin a small fortune on a deck. I don't think you could. Well, I, I want to pretend that I can. You so. spent the money, so you wanted to. Yeah. yeah. No, it made sense. -ish. Anyway, so there's that. And now we're looking at the main bit that we need to, the bread and butter kind of question that we need to get right. Worth four marks. If we get it right, that's some easy four marks coming our way. Is calculating the file size of a sound file. Let's remember the key algorithm. The key algorithm being, so a sound file. So let's do this in uh, in red. Sound file. Oh no. So a sound file. Sa uh, sound. Am up. I should say file size actually. File size. What are the things that are going to go into making the file size for a uh, sound file. What are the things we need to care about? Sample rate, which will be the hertz bit. Nope, I put a K in there. Uh, times by, what's the next thing we need? Sample resolution. Do we need anything else? Yeah, duration in seconds. Are you, is it necessary for you to write that, that thing? No, it's not. It's just necessary for you to use it. I'm putting it there so we have it. So let's review. Our, uh, let's review the, um, let's review our bit of co our bit of question here. If we're looking through it, let's highlight the pertinent bits of information. The sound engineer is using a sample rate of 2000 Hertz. Important? Yeah. That is going to be where we're going to get our sample rate for. And a sample resolution of four bits. Yeah. Yeah. What is the minimum file size of a five second recording? So the last bit we need to care about is five seconds. There we go. Right, now let's come back to where we were originally and then let's plug those things in. So which one was sample rate? Which number? Guys, which number for sample rate? So the next thing will be sample resolution, which is four bits. Yep, I'll, say, I'll call it four, but remember, the answer we'll get at the end will be in bits. And then the last thing, Tyrone, what's the what? Five seconds, there we go. So we need to calculate all this together. And we should say that's 2,000 times by four is 8,000 times by four, times by five is, the answer is 40,000. Yeah, so 2,000 times by four is 8,000 times by five is 40,000. Yep. Have we, is that, is the answer 40,000, because it's 40,000 what have we got? Bits. Bits. Is that the answer? Or, no. What's the last thing we need to do? Yeah. Let's pay, let's be, let's pay attention to the fact it says given in bytes. I dare say that's one mark lost if we don't do it. So what should the answer be? Four bytes. I mean, no. There's, four. Yeah, there's eight bits in a byte. So 4,000 divided by eight, which was what? Sorry, guys. 5,000 bytes. Should I have recorded this as five kilobytes? No. Why shouldn't I? Yeah, yeah, you do what you're told in this sort of situation, I'm afraid. Guys, continuation on sound representation, camera question. People, guess what I want you to do? I want you to read this and actually attempt these. It's multiple guess. So, a sound engineer, please stop talking. Oh. The sound engineer currently uses a sample resolution of four bits, which enables a sample to be stored in one of 16 different bit patterns, right? This is exactly as we looked at with color depth. She wants to increase the number of bits from 16 to 32, shade one, a lozenge, which shows the minimum sample resolution. So the answer to that would be five. Beautiful. On the other side, we've got one lozenge, so which of the following correctly states the effect of increasing the sample rate? So if you sample it more often, if you sample it more often, does it decrease the quality? Does it decrease the quality? No. No. Has no effect on the quality? No. Improves the quality? No. It does improve the quality, but has no effect on file size? No. Improves the quality and increases the file yeah. size? Yeah, because yeah. you're effectively... The way that you're achieving it is by squeezing in more ones and zeros, which will, increase, which will get closer to what the analog sound like, but will increase the file size.
Before, allow me the opportunity to do a quick recap of what the three logic gates are. I'm going to draw them. We're going to talk about them. Two, three minutes max. And then you guys will be able to use that information. Deal? So we have got three logic gates that we care about. What are those three? Well, as you just said, one of them is and. One of them is or. One of them is not. What do you need to be able to do? Well, you need to be able to draw them. You need to understand their logic with a truth table. So let's draw them. Of course, my drawing abilities are not exactly awesome, but that'd be good for demonstration. For an AND gate, the important thing to remember is it starts with a flat on this side, and then it's this shape. How many inputs does an AND gate have? Two. Two. How many outputs? One. One. Beautiful. And then we might even do things like say A input, B input, O output, and OR gate. What's different versus an, or, versus an AND gate is it's curved on this side. So it's curved like so, and that's the OR gate. How many inputs for an OR gate? Two. How many outputs? One. Beautiful. And we can do the same thing again, A and B. A NOT gate, how is it different? Triangle. Draw the triangle, and not just a triangle, what else does it need? Circle. Little, yeah, a little bobble at the end. How many inputs? One. One. Truth tables, if you're asked to do so, as a quick recap, is that you've got a input here, B input, and O output. And then you've got to describe all the different combinations. What are the different combinations? They both could be off, and you write that as zero, zero. What's the next combination I could do? What's the next combination I could do? What's the next combination I could do? One, one. I'm just going to be a bit lazy and steal that for my OR gate. Go on work, you know you want to. Beautiful. There you go. It's technology. Go on. Go on. Uh, I know, I know. So the tech skill straight up my Oh, should have done that. Uh, for the next one here then, let's look at the outputs, because that's what's relevant. In an AND gate, here's the core logic. You care about when it's on, because it only is on under one combination. Is it, what's the one combination when it's going to be on? One, one. When they're both the inputs are on. Perfect. So it's going to be one for that, and all the rest of them are going to be... Zero. Boom, boom, boom. The OR gate's the opposite. It's only off under one condition. What's the one condition where it's going to be off? If they're both off. They're both off. So you can put in zero. What's the rest of them going to be? One, one, one. one. Hey, do we need to do a, tr um, a truth table for my NOT gate? Nah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. But what's different is how many different combinations do you need to worry about? Well, zero or one. In a not gate, zero. a zero becomes, a one. and a one becomes a, zero. so it just flips that value along. Thank you so much for your uh, concentration. And then let's start applying it. State the name of this, what kind of logic gate is this? And, and. Beautiful. And. And now it's a lot more complicated and it's about applying it to the context of the question here. So it's giving you a scenario it's showing you, do you remember what it's called when you've got a combination of logic gates put together? It's a logical yeah. circuit. And we have to read this and then link the logic. So, A, give you one clue straight away. How many inputs are going into L1? One. Have I even read anything here? No. But if there's only one input coming in, what must it be? Not. So we know that L1's not. The other ones, L2, L3, and L4, what must they be? Either... And or or. Yeah. And or or. And we don't... No, and... Yeah, and or or. Well, it's a bit confusing, isn't it? Either and... Or or. Yeah, okay, I don't know how to get around that. Okay, one of and or... No, I'm done. <laughs> anyway, here we have to now read the question. No, so let's have a quick read, shall we? So what we're looking for here is we're looking at this logic and seeing if we can figure out how it works. Let's read it together. Story time. A... Partially completed logic circuit is shown below. It detects if a computer has been set up correctly. All right, so let's get it all in so we can see it all together. Right. There are two keyboard input devices. That's keyboard A and that's keyboard B. Either one of them can be a connected computer system. So it's got two keyboards, A and B. However, if they are both connected, then the computer will not work. Ah, so if they're both connected... It won't work. Uh, output P has a value 1. If either A or B, but not both, is connected to the computer system, 
and zero otherwise. So this bit here is going to be uh, on if either to or A or B, but not both. Okay. Do you know, that's an XOR gate, but never mind. So in here, we're saying if A is connected and B is not connected, will it work? So it says there are two keyboards, both A and B, and either one can be connected, either not at the same time. Right? So if A is one and B is one, what should happen? Shouldn't work. Okay? In here, we're saying that this is what? What did we say this was going to be? A not gate. So here, at this point here, A is going to be, if A was one here, what would it be here? It would be not A, so the opposite of it. So if A was one, it would be zero. But in here, it's saying that's one. You see that? So it's saying if A is not on, sorry, if A is on, that will say one. If B is, is on, that will say not on. So let's, sometimes what's easy, easier to do is to plug it in with some real examples. So if A was one and B was one, what should happen? It should not work, right? Yeah. So if A is one, that will make that zero. If B was one, that will make that one. And then we should say that that should then come through here. And, and on the flip side, if A is one here, so actually, uh, sorry, in this case, if they're both on, and we've got and now the combination coming here with zero and one, what can you put to, and, and what could you put here to make the output be zero? So let's think about that for a second. Let's review the other side. If A was one and B was zero, Right? Yeah. Let's evaluate, so we make it concrete again. If B was zero, and it, uh, it's going to be zero here, if A is one, it's going to be zero there, so zero and zero. But on this side, if B is zero, that will be, what will it be here? One. one. And A would be one. If that was one and one, what would the output be? Zero. If it was an AND gate. Oh, so it would be one. Yes? Well, if we flip it, let's go the other way around, and let's say A is 0 and B is 1, shall we? Let's evaluate it here. If A is 0, that not gate's going to make it 1. And then B here was going to be 1, so it's also 1. It would have to be an AND gate. Yeah. So these two are going to be AND gates. Beautiful. See that? So I know they're not super straightforward to read these ones here. What's the things that you can do straight away? If there's a single input, what does it tell you it must be? A not gate, and then what did I do to help figure it out? I plugged in values to help me figure it out. So what we've got here is we've got L2 is going to be a what gate then? L3, L4. I know that's not super, super straightforward, but I'm just trying to, you know, when you're in that situation, what you want to do is, is and make it as concrete as possible by plugging in real numbers. I know it's easy for me to say, but... Should we look at the next one? Yeah, man. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to give you a bit of time to read this one and try and think it through as well. Remember the tips I gave you? If you're looking at gate one, if we're looking at gate one in particular, what might you be thinking? Uh, no. Yeah. In fact, they're telling you what the expression is. Look, at the top. See that? They're giving you the expression. Do you remember I spent a long time teaching you about how to draw logical circuits? Do you remember what the tip was? That you draw from inside the logical gate. Uh, so inside the bracket, rather. So not would be first, and then you work from inside the bracket out. So, so that case that, well, is actually quite straightforward. There's a lot more straightforward than the other question. I'm going to pause. Let's apply some of the logic we just learned. That gate one there, what do you reckon it's going to be? I don't know. Think about it. How many inputs has it got going into it? So which gates only have one input going into it? Yeah, but what's the name of the gate? Gate one. Yeah, so for this one here, because gate one only has a single input going in, we know that that must be a not gate. Uh, gate two, gate three, and gate four both have two inputs, so they must be either and 
or or. State the name of the lodging gate, use it gate two. I've got, um, I've got a question. So in this context, uh, if you remember, if you remember, if you were gonna, because this, this at the top here, you see that B and not A or B and C. If you were drawing it, you go from the in, sorry, if you were drawing this diagram, you go from the inside out in terms of the brackets. The first thing you'd want to do, what's the most inside brackets is that not gate, which is what we did. And then the next one are the two AND gates. And then the last one is the OR. So I would say that that's an OR and those two are AND. So, so we've got AND, crushing it guys. And then it says draw the logic gate in the space below for gate three. So gate three, we're gonna draw a, for gate three, we're gonna draw, what are we gonna draw? An AND gate. What's an AND gate look like? Square. Well, no, not square. Straight line, and then like a curved bit like that. How many inputs? Two. One, two. How many outputs? One. One. Draw the logic symbol for figure for gate four, and gate four is a. What do you say gate four was going to be? That is so weird, dude. That's what defeats the purpose somewhat of a mask. Plus, like there's ten minutes left of this lesson. Have you you got that as well? Have you? Right, fine. Right, what do we draw? Guys, what do we draw? Uh, uh, or gate. Alfie, yes, sir. you were with it. Stay with it, please. Yes, sir. In fact, Claris, you're going to redeem yourself from what you just did. Claris, gate four, what gate is it? Uh, no. No? And, and. No? no. Process of elimination? Or. Or. How do you draw the or gate to make it clearly an or gate and not an and gate? Curve, right? You get that curve. Guys, don't make it weird, right? So we make the OR gate go in there. Boom, boom. Two inputs going in, one output, input, output going out. And then finally, this question, you've got the logic, the Boolean expression here for it. It's not asking you to draw the logical circuit or anything there, it's there. And then here, it's saying what the logic's gonna be, and it's saying, you have to figure out which one of these is similar to this one and then complete the truth table for this one here. You know what I'm gonna do? Okay, so looking at this question, this is the kind of question that might throw you at the beginning because it's throwing you this quite complex Boolean expression and it's showing you this quite complex um, truth table. Don't be thrown at it. Let's work through it one at a time. It says shade one lozenge, which shows a similar expression, which is the equivalent of the original. So that's the original, it's all this one here, and that's the big truth table. More complex expression. So, is it not A? Well, if, if it's not A1, sorry, not A1 would mean that it would become, zero would become one. So, it, and zero, so that's not happening, is it? A2 or A3? So A2, so if zero or zero will give you? Zero. So that could work. Zero or one will give you? One. So that's not working, so it can't be that one. A1 and not A3. So A1 is 0, not A2. So not 0 would become 1. So 0 and 1 would give you... 0 and 1 would give you 0. So that could work. Uh, let's find somewhere where it's going to be okay. So like 1, 1 and not 0. So not 0 is going to be... One, so one and one should give you one, and it's not giving you one, so it can't be that one. So kind of by process elimination, it must be this one. A1 and A3. So if it's A1, uh, so zero and zero will give you zero. Zero and one will give you zero. Let's look at the two times where it's one. One here. One and one should give you... One and one should give you... One. One. So, and one and zero should give you zero. I think it's that bottom one. It's D, isn't it? Looking over here, completing the trace table, the truth table here. Remember, truth tables are for logical circuits. Trace tables are for when you're going through an algorithm. X, Y, X and Y, the value is going to be zero and zero will give you... Come on, people, let's do this. We're almost there. Zero and zero is going to give you... Zero. Zero. Zero and one's gonna give you zero. zero. One and zero is gonna give you 
one and one is going to give you one. Beautiful. Let's do not, not x. So not zero is going to give you, not zero is going to give you, not one is going to give you, not one is going to give you. Beautiful. And now this one, it's saying this. But if you notice, we've just done x and y here. Or not x, which is what you've done here. So it's saying basically an or of both of these. Zero or one is going to give you one. Zero or one is going to give you. Zero or zero is going to give you. And one or zero is going to give you. 